Canada's a unique place. There's nowhere else like it in the world. It's the only lintled stone circle in the world. And it's so iconic and so familiar that it just draws attention. It's an extremely important monument. And you can see just behind me that it's been engineered to have these wonderful sort of stone arches and at its core, at its heart, in alignment with the sun. Stonehenge is probably the world's most famous prehistoric alignment. It's aligned to the rising and setting of the sun, the midsummer sunrise and the midwinter sunset. And this is believed to have been an intentional feature. To capture an alignment to both midwinter and midsummer is very, very rare, especially when it happens on the same line. That doesn't happen anywhere in the world. If you want to explore meaning, what these things are meant for people, you need to step away from that hard data, you need to step into a bit, little bit of speculation. You can only speculate about the things you know. So there could be a whole host of interpretations for Stonehenge and its alignments that we haven't even considered. Right at the end of the late Neolithic, around the time of Stonehenge, people are building lots of monuments. And it's about trying to get really precise dates for when those were built and seeing how that relates to major changes that were happening in society at that time. Unfortunately, we don't have a written record from this period of time, so we really have to rely on all these new scientific techniques and some of this groundbreaking research. And we have stories we can tell now that we couldn't tell 10 years ago. One of the recent projects I've been involved in is looking at the origins of the sarsen stones at Stonehenge. And those stones are a type of silica. Using something called a PXRF machine, a portable X-ray fluorescence analyzer, we can look at the percentages of different components inside the rock and look at trace elements that are not just the silica and map where the fingerprint of those sarsens may have come from. So some work has been done which has um, mapped the natural sarsen spread across southern England and tried to match up the readings from Stonehenge and those natural sarsens. And that's pinpointed an area called Westwoods and that's our best match for where the sarsen stones at Stonehenge were brought from. So there's some really exciting research going on there that shows another link with stones being brought to Stonehenge from somewhere other than Wales. Just this week, we've discovered that one of our stones at the center of the circle, called the altar stone, we don't know where it comes from because the, the chemistry of that stone is completely different than all the other stones here. So that's another mystery. So, so there's still going to be these questions and, and the new scientific um, techniques are really opening up a new world of understanding about sites like Stonehenge. There's not one Stonehenge. It's a monument that was changed over a long period of time and it was used by people by over, for over a thousand years. We know that new people are coming from Europe, bringing with them the first metals, new types of pottery, new ideas, probably new languages and new religion. So there's a big period of change. These people really would have been watching the skies and, and had a deep understanding of the movements of the different planets, the stars, the, the sun and the moon. And what's really interesting is there might be a practical element to that, you know, understanding the cycles of the year, when to plant your crops, when to move your animals is, is a really important thing. But over time, these seem to actually get a religious meaning and, and we get these monuments such as Stonehenge marking those. But the earliest form of Stonehenge was actually a cemetery. So we know people were burying their dead here in the form of cremations about 500 years before they actually built the stone circle. So it's a place where people came to celebrate their ancestors and commemorate maybe the dead in the grandest way possible. We can look at what other cultures believe in when they relate to the midwinter and the midsummer sun and see if those ideas apply to Stonehenge. So for example, midwinter across the world is seen as a time when the sun is dying. The sun is at its lowest in the sky, the days are at its shortest. But what happens afterwards? The sun comes back to life. Every day after midwinter is slightly longer than the previous day. And that's an indication for many, many societies across the world that there is life after death. Just like the sun comes back to life, the ancestors will come back to life in some form, not necessarily on earth, but maybe in the upper world, maybe in the sky. So that idea may very well apply to Stonehenge. There are many other clues in the archaeological record in sites at Stonehenge and around Stonehenge that suggest Stonehenge may have been a place for the ancestors, may be connected to the ancestors. So the midwinter alignment relates very nicely to that. A few archaeologists about a decade ago were excavating the avenue that leads into Stonehenge. They found glacial striations that were created by the melting ice sheets at the end of the last ice age they align naturally to the solstices. 
So pe the people who built Stonehenge may have noticed this coincidence, but they saw meaning in there. And that may very well, well be why they then built Stonehenge where it's now with those alignments. People were coming together to celebrate that moment of the sun kind of being reborn, the turning of the year as we call it. Down the road, we have a place where they were living and feasting as they built the, the stone circle um, called Durrington Walls. And almost they were having the equivalent of what we would consider barbecues. There are lots and lots of animal bones there. And there's been analysis done of the isotopes from the teeth of those animals, which has shown that they were raised on geologies that were very varied. And perhaps it's, it's almost like you do a pilgrimage to, it's almost like going to Mecca. You, you take, go from your local community, you bring your animals, and you take part in this big communal project that's, that's got this kind of wide remit. It's always been a place of gathering, and it's really wonderful that people still want to come here and celebrate. At Stonehenge, we have a solstice connection, so it connects to, to the shortest and longest days of the year, and stones within the circle mark those moments. And we know people are coming to celebrate at those times but there might be other connections. So one thing we're looking to investigate now is the moon and its connection to Stonehenge. We're very excited about something that is happening in the sky in the next two years, which we call the major lunar standstill. It's something that happens only every 19 years. And for about two years, the moon is going to be rising on a place on the horizon where the sun never rises. It also does that at the setting. And there's been suggestions for the past maybe 50, 60 years, that there are four stones at Stonehenge, the station stones, that align to the moon when the moon is doing those things. So ne over the next two years, we're going to have the opportunity to observe, record, register the moon rising in alignment to the station stones to try to study and see how accurate those alignments are, whether we think they are meaningful or whether it's just one big coincidence. As archaeologists, we can sometimes just keep going around the same circles and we need a way of testing these different hypotheses against the data. And that's perhaps the most difficult challenge. So there could be a whole host of interpretations for Stonehenge and its alignments that we haven't even considered.